Uh, the message follows the songs very closely. Uh, we're quickly approaching the end time, but we still have a little while. And in the meantime, we have some responsibilities that we are obligated to take care of. Again, I didn't mention anything to, to, brother, uh, to brother Nick, but thankful that he followed the Lord uh, this morning. As we get into the uh, message, and again, I am not, I think most of you know me, I'm not long-winded and we're getting an early start this morning. So uh, maybe with the Lord's help, we'll get through this and we, can, uh, uh, we won't keep you too long this morning. But as we get into, uh, into the message, there's a passage, if there's ever been a passage of Scripture that inspires the message of God's deliverance and hope of a victory, it's in Acts chapter 16. And it's not a new uh, set of Scriptures for us this morning. It's not a, a, a shocking revelation or great theological undertaking uh, that we're going to delve into the Scriptures this morning. But it's a chapter that speaks on deliverance. This chapter shares the testimonies of Paul and Silas who were taken captive for doing nothing more than delivering a woman of a demon and preaching the gospel. So here they were. They were following the plan of God. They were going and doing what Christ had commanded of, of uh, uh, bringing deliverance to the captives and sharing the gospel message so that all could come to know the salvation of the Lord. Their commitment also in this passage, so we know the passage, they, uh, they do these things and then they get locked up in jail. So they do something good and then ultimately they find themselves, themselves captive, but for the sake of the gospel. Their commitment though is a commitment of rejoicing through adversity and that's captured very clearly in this passage and it's given to us as an example because many times we face, now again, we may not be locked up in jail, but at many times we face adversities ourselves where we feel captive and we're reminded by these passages that if Paul and Silas can be beaten and thrown in jail and still rejoice, then so likewise can we. They continue to pray. They continue to sing praises all through the night even though they had been beaten falsely accused, and incarcerated. And their moment of victory came at midnight though, when God Himself sent an earthquake and shook their jail cell. And again, we know the passage and we know the story. Their chains fell off, the prison doors opened, and now the captives were no longer captive, but they were set free. The most beautiful part of the story though, isn't that they sang and they prayed while in captivity, it's that uh, even after they were delivered. So their story began with a story of deliverance and salvation or the preaching of salvation. They themselves were delivered physically. And then they turned around and preached deliverance and salvation to the jailer who accepted it for not only himself, but his family did as well. The jailer would have been the one tasked with beating Paul and Silas. Yet rather than fleeing, going, this man hurt me, this man beat us, this man uh, did us wrong. Rather than fleeing, Paul says, we're going to stick around and save his life spiritually. We're going to stick around and preach to him. And we're going to share the gospel with him. And he's going to know the same salvation and deliverance that we have found being delivered from this world. They saved his life physically by staying at the jail rather than fleeing because he would have been killed if all of the prisoners had, uh, had escaped. But they, more importantly, they saved his life spiritually because they introduced him to Jesus Christ. To paraphrase the scripture, it says, Don't be afraid, believe on the Lord, and you and your house shall be saved. At that moment, the same man who beat Paul and Silas is on his knees receiving Jesus Christ. And he invites them to, their, to his home. Acts 16, 31-33 says, And they said, Believe on, Jesus, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. 
And they spake unto him the words of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. What a humbling scene this must have been. You put yourself in the place of the jailer who, again, had certainly had a wide range of emotions over the several hours that transpired in this story, going from, oh no, everyone's escaped, I'm going to lose my life, to I now not only have my physical life, but I have been restored spiritually. I have a spiritual life that I didn't experience previously. And not only that, in his heart and in his mind, he's going, I just beat these men. And yet they, saved, they shared the message with me that has ultimately saved my life. And now I am uh, uh, carrying out an act of uh, restitution by washing their stripes. Many of the same stripes that I had caused. How would this warden have felt at this moment? How would you have felt at that moment? Certainly it would have been a moving time. It would have been a moving experience. He washed those stripes that had cut deep. Possibly they had become infected. We don't know. But he's binding the wounds that shortly previously he had caused. Many times before God does the greatest miracles in our lives, He requires that we wash some stripes. And what an expression and picture of the salvation, of His salvation when He immediately turned around and washed the stripes of those He had hurt. What a substantial life change. His salvation was not just a lip service or a prayer of a sinner's prayer. He was actively carrying out and showing fruit of his salvation. But you know, the story does, that's the story that we're co commonly familiar with. But the story doesn't end there. The story of Paul and Silas in this town does not end at that point. The scripture goes on, and we read through verse 33, but we'll go on to verse 35 of the same chapter, reading through verse 37. It says, And when it was day, the magistrates sent the servants, saying, Let those men go. We don't want anything to do with them anymore. Let them go. And the keeper of the prison told this to Paul, said, Hey, they've, they've chosen to, you know, they want you to get out of town. And the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison, and now they thrust us out privately? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Paul was, uh, uh, was not interested in leaving town quietly. You know, as this story goes, uh, the, you know, the magistrates or the people of the city had captured them and said, we're going to throw you in jail. We don't want you preaching and teaching and delivering people in our city. We're going we're to put you in, in captivity. And God said, you're not going to be in captivity. I'm going to, I want my people to be free. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you out. And the people of the city said, well, we don't want a commotion. And clearly something has transpired here. So rather than uh, it become more than what it is, let's ask these people to leave and they can leave privately and I don't have, we don't have to deal with them anymore. But Paul said, no. You've made a big scene uh, capturing us, beating us, throwing us in jail. You've made a big scene. Now you want us to leave quietly. We're not going to do that. I can imagine Paul and his... Uh, Holy stubbornness, as we'll put it, says, this is not how this story is going to go down. Paul refused to leave unless the same men that had captured him and caused, to, uh, uh, had caused him to be thrown in jail would come and make a big commotion to parade them out of town. He required the town's leaders to escort them to make a show of the testimony of their innocence and of what God had done through them. 
and for the people of that city. When the town falsely accused them, they did it publicly. Yet now when their innocence was declared, Paul would not settle for them to be quietly dismissed as Christians. When there had been, or where there had been public shame, Paul demanded public honor. Again, I can just imagine how this unfolded. And can you can put yourself in the place of, of the city magistrates, the city leaders. Here they are. They probably conspired among themselves. How are we going to get rid of these men without just up, causing an uproar in our town? How are we going to get rid of them? We'll, we'll escort them out under, you know, we'll have them leave under the cloak of, of silence. Let, let's just get rid of them. Let's be done with them. Let's, let's hide them away. But Paul says, we're not going to hide. Our presence is going to be known. Our presence is going to be uh, recognized. And if they don't want us here, they're going to let the people of the city know what God did through us. And they're going to escort us out and let it be known that we're not welcome. Paul probably pondered in his mind, why do you want me to tiptoe out of town? When the reality is that God had set me free from your chains and your bondage. Perhaps this passage about Paul and Silas is really an analogy of the church today. And it, perhaps it's given for us to, to learn how it is that we're supposed to live our lives in this world. How we're supposed to act right before the rapture. How we're supposed to act before the end of the world. You know, as children of God, we're not supposed to leave this world quietly. You know, in, as you read through the Bible, the Bible lays out end times events. And we see the terrible things that are going to transpire in this, transpire in this world through the course of the end times. And we're beginning to see many of those things now. We look around and we see pestilences, we see famines, we see uh, wars and rumors of wars. And it's been going on for years and years and years. People have been using the scripture and comparing it to, to, to current events and recognizing that certainly we are in the end times. And I'm not here to uh, deny that today. I believe that. I believe that we all believe that we are living in the last days. You look at how wicked the world is becoming, how perverse it's becoming, and it's very clear to us that we are in the times that we were warned about. But even amidst all of that, the Bible doesn't just talk about terrible things that are going to happen. It also talks about in the end, the church is going to be light to the world. The church is going to be a city set on a hill. And we are. We are that now. But she's going to shine forth even brighter. Uh, certainly there will be persecutions and it may be more difficult for those things to happen. But the reality is God has promised that the church is going to raise the dead, heal the sick, bring deliverance to the captives, and on and on and on. All these great things. The Bible tells us in another place that the latter house would be greater than the former house. The Bible tells us that, uh, that we would do even greater miracles. Jesus said we would do greater miracles than even He. For all of these things to be true, that's not a quiet exit. That's not a uh, slipping into our little corner and just waiting out patiently for the Lord's return. No, that's making a little bit of noise. That's making a lot of noise as we prepare to leave this world. Before the church uh, is raptured, there is an enemy or spiritual force moving in this world that's saying the church should be silent. And I'll even take it a little bit further. You know, we, as the church right now, we recognize the difference in the church and in the kingdom. And this force in the world is even saying that the kingdom should be silent. Just be quiet. Don't, don't preach salvation. Don't preach deliverance. Don't preach hope. Don't preach comfort. Don't preach any of those things. 
Stay in your corner. Don't try to influence society. Just be silent. You, you can do your thing. Just don't bother anybody else. This spirit says that the church ought to stay within the four walls, not cause any scenes, shouldn't stir the pot or create a disturbance, and by no means should openly share Jesus or try to impart their values on others. This spirit says, stay out of the public discussion. Don't get involved in matters outside of the, the, the walls of the church. Ultimately, mind your own business. Be quiet. Don't affect your community, your nation, or your world. That's what this spirit that is moving in the world would prefer. It would prefer that we remain not influential. It would prefer that we remain quiet. It would prefer that we be high maintenance, low impact. Rather than high impact and low maintenance. But what Jesus is looking for from the church is a group of people who will get louder and louder as the world gets worse and worse. Paul could have very easily in his situation misapplied the fruit of the Spirit. He could have said, well, you know, my letter, what God spoke to me to write in my letter says that the fruit of the Spirit is peace and kindness and gentleness and meekness and long-suffering. So I'll just be quiet and you know, I'll satisfy what these people want and I'll just exit town Quietly, I'll go, I'll go about my way to not create a disturbance. But no, he didn't do that because he recognized that that's not what God wants from us. He said, no, he knew when to roar like a lion. Paul knew that there are times to be calm like a lamb. But in other times, there's times to roar like a lion, to, pro to proclaim the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our hope, our peace, our deliverer. There's a time that we as a church should be meek and mild, but there is also a time, and it's more so even as the end approaches, to preach louder and louder. When the world wants us to back up and be silent, we must proclaim the answer, Jesus Christ, even more loudly. We must refuse to allow the truth to be silenced. The spirit in the world wants nothing more than truth to be silenced because they don't believe in truth. They believe in some, uh, they don't believe in absolutes. They, they, uh, they the, the term uh, relativism or uh, believing your truth is such a prominent mentality in our society. I've, I've told Ashley before, I said that probably is the one phrase that just absolutely uh, uh, grates my nerves is, I, I'm speaking my truth. I'm speaking my truth. What I, my truth. The world doesn't need Nick's truth and Rick's truth. The world needs Jesus' truth because that's the only Absolute truth. Now I know as children of God, your truth is His truth. But what the world needs, as the world continues to get worse and worse and worse and worse, what the world needs is Christ's truth, God's truth. So that they can hear and know and be delivered and comforted. And, and ultimately as we were studying in Sunday school, reconciled back to the Father through the Son so that they can know eternal life in the same way that we have known and experienced eternal life through Him. Why do we do this? We do it for the sake of our families because we want our families to know the Lord. We want our families to be saved. We want our loved ones to be saved. We want our friends to be saved. We want... Uh, as children of God, we should even want our enemies to be saved. 
We should even want those, what does the Bible say? Pray for those that despitefully use you. Love even your enemies. We should want them also to be saved. We must conduct ourselves in a way that when we leave, and I'm talking about leaving in the rapture, we should conduct ourselves so loudly that when we do leave, the devil will be glad we're gone. You think about that, that statement. We should conduct ourselves in a way that when we finally do leave, the devil is glad we're gone. No, he may not have won against us. And he may not win overall. We know that in the scripture. We know that through the promises of the Lord. But when we're gone, he's glad we're gone because we had disrupted his plan so much. That's the way, that's the example that Paul and Silas gave to us. I'm not leaving quietly. I'm not leaving uh, in, in a tiptoe out of town. I am leaving boldly and loudly and everyone's going to know that I'm a child of God and everyone's going to know that there's a saving grace through the Lord that, that they can experience as well. We can see this spirit moving in the world, the spirit of uh, wanting to silence us. We can see it happening uh, as it sweeps across our country, across our world, everywhere. Um, that te- you know, they tell us, don't say anything controversial. Don't say anything that is absolute. Don't say anything that, is, that is, might be perceived to be offensive to someone. Just be silent. But in your hearts and in, in, as you... Uh, Discern the Spirit this morning. Do you feel the Spirit saying, the real Spirit, the true Spirit, the Holy Spirit? Do you see, do you feel Him saying that this morning? You know what? Just be silent. Just be quiet. It's okay. I'm coming for you just a little bit longer. Hang on. No, that's not what the Holy Ghost is telling us this morning. That's not at all what the Holy Ghost is telling us this morning. The Holy Ghost is saying, you're not supposed to leave quiet. You're not supposed to just... Uh, uh, fall into your corner. Why should you be quiet if you're proclaiming the words and the greatness of the one true King, the creator of heaven and earth? Why should you be silent? You've got the greatest message that this world's ever, ever heard. And it's up to you and it's up to me to ensure that the world hears and knows and experiences what we have experienced. We're not supposed to be a pitiful, little, weak body of believers. We're not supposed to be pitiful, weak, little children of God. Paul recognized that in his own self, he was nothing. But he recognized that Christ in him was something great and powerful. And, and we, we look at Peter, for example. Uh, before Peter received the Spirit, he, he was a little timid and he, 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 was, he didn't want to be... You know, we, we look at where he failed the Lord and he denied Christ. He was, he was not one that wanted... He wanted to go silent. He, he wanted to fly under the radar, so to speak. But when the Spirit fell on him, just a couple of book, chapters later, when the Spirit fell on him, he became bold and loud and proclaimed the gospel and preached. And we see the impact that he had in Jerusalem that day. Then we look at ourselves and we say, we see the boldness of Paul. We see the boldness of a spirit-filled Peter. We see the boldness of all the others throughout the Word of God who we could use as our examples. And the Holy Spirit within us is saying, I want to use you the same way. Again, going back to the songs that, uh, that Brother Nick led us in this morning, there's just a little bit longer, a little bit more time There's still work to be done. Jesus used me. And I believe that the Holy Ghost within us is speaking to each one of us this morning saying, I do have a work for you. I do have a a plan for you. I have a a, a job for you. Don't be silent. Don't be quiet. Uh, You know, Paul and Silas could have stopped and said, you know, we were beaten. This town doesn't want us. Let's just be silent and sit over here minding our own business. But no, they didn't do that. The Holy Ghost within them said, preach Speak, deliver, do, continue doing the work. 
in spite of those things. Do the work. Deliver. Share the message. I've commanded you to heal. I've commanded you to raise the dead. I've commanded you to cast out devils. I've commanded you uh, uh, to preach salvation. And again, we could go on and on and on with the list. And Paul and Silas chose to do, to continue carrying out the plan of God. We're supposed to leave or exit shouting, healing the sick, casting out devils, performing many signs and wonders as the Spirit uh, leads us to do. We're supposed to leave speaking in tongues, prophesying, interceding, praying, lifting up the name of Jesus, rejoicing, and on and on. Matthew 24 and 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. We can never back up from ministering. We can never back up for being an example for Christ. The enemy would want to uh, calm us down. They would want us to uh, be diminished. They would want us to be silent. They would want us to be... Uh, again, using the, the term just kind of set off to our corner, not really being influential. But the Spirit wants us to influence. The Spirit wants us to cultivate. The Spirit wants us to uh, bring forth fruit. The Spirit wants so much more. Today, who are we going to heed? Are we going to heed the Spirit in this world that's moving to say, silence and, 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 and stay in your lane? Or are we going to heed the Spirit of God that is saying, go and preach and deliver and heal and do the signs and wonders as led by the Spirit? Again, are we there yet? No, absolutely not. Have we reached the fullness? Absolutely not. The church, the kingdom, the church, us as individuals need to remember that the end times do not happen to influence the church certainly as tribulation gets worse, as times get more difficult. You know, you look in the book of Acts, when tribulation came, it did strengthen the church a little bit, and it did uh, cause them to go and spread the message more and more. It, but not so much because they faced tribulation. They grew spiritually because in, in the face of tribulation, they got closer to God. They prayed more. They sought the Lord more. They rejoiced more. They fellowshiped with one another more. They did all of those things and that built them up. They did it because of the tribulation that they faced. But it was their relation, their deeper growing relationship with God that brought them to that place. The end times do not happen to influence the church. The church is to influence the end times. We're not supposed to lose our freedom of preaching, but we are to boldly proclaim the Word of God and change the world one soul at a time. We're to boldly proclaim and change our community one soul at a time. We're to boldly proclaim, and we'll bring it closer to home, we're to boldly proclaim and preach to transform our families one soul at a time. We're to boldly proclaim to ultimately to grow ourselves to be more like Christ one day at a time. Daniel 11 and 32 reminds us that the people who know God are to be strong and do great exploits. As I said before, we should be so loud and bold and walking in the Spirit that the devil is glad when we're gone. You know, I'm looking forward to the rapture because the rapture our, our ultimate goal is to spend eternity in heaven. The rapture is just our vehicle to get there. But the devil should be looking forward to it just as much. Not that he's going to find any deliverance in the sense of salvation, but we ought to be disrupt. I said it before, we ought to be eg uh, loudly exiting and disrupting his destructive plans, tormenting him by proclaiming the gospel so much that he gets... Some, some sense of deliverance because we're no longer there to disrupt Him. We're to not live so overwhelmed when facing the end times, but 
You know, sometimes people get so overwhelmed by end times because they, they see the tribulation that's going to be poured out. They see the wrath of God that's going to, that the world is going to face, and it becomes overwhelming. Look at all this despair and terribleness and, and gloom and agony. And, and certainly, yes, the Bible does bear out that those things will happen. And in the midst of those things, the enemy would want, the enemy of our souls would want us to become so focused on those things that we lose sight. You know, they, he wants us to focus on how bad the world is going to get. And the world has become worse and worse and worse. You know, even in my short life, compared to the history of the world, I can look at my life and see how much the world has declined. You know, I don't consider myself to be very old. I can look at the last 10 years and we, everyone can do that. Everyone here can do that. Just look at the last 10 years. What's transpired? You know, we, we, we don't think of uh, 2013 as all that long ago, but it's 10 years ago. And look at how, how much has transpired. How much worse, how much more abundant has sin become? Or how much more loud has sin become? Have we kept up with that loudness? It's a sobering thought for us this morning, but have we as the children of God, the people of God, have we kept up with that loudness? The sinners of the world, the wicked of the world, are again, they have become bold and brazen in their, in their uh, uh, trying to popularize their sin, to make it acceptable, to make it the social norm. Have we kept up with that by saying no? That is not the way of God. That is not the plan of God. That is not the, the desires of God. It's not within the plan of God that this should happen. If we've not done that, individually, as the church, as part of the kingdom, if we've not done that, then we've allowed ourselves to be influenced by that worldly spirit that is saying, be quiet, be silent, just go sit in your corner, stay in your lane, I'm going to exit you out of town quietly. But today we can resolve that no more. This is not going to happen anymore. From now on, I'm going to be noisy. I'm going to be like Paul and say, you're not going to just escort me out of town privately. No, I'm going to boldly proclaim the word of the Lord. It may get me in trouble. It may cause me one day to face captivity. But nevertheless, I'm set free by the blood of Christ. They may put us in chains. They may lock us up. But the reality of the matter is I'm set free on the things in the ways that matter. And in doing so, and in doing so, we will please the Lord and please, uh, please God for what He is trying to accomplish. God wants us to focus on how good things are going to get. You know, looking forward to the rapture is a good thing. Looking forward to the, the short period of time that we have until His return, until our exit is a good thing. It's a positive thing. It's, a, it's something to look forward to because our eternal life is nigh at hand. We also can look forward to some things here in this temporal life because I don't believe that God is done with the church. As I read the Bible, I look at a perfected, I see a perfected church. I see a glorious church. I see a church without spot and wrinkle. I see a church that's walking in the power of the Spirit. I see a church that's walking uh, in the fruit of the Spirit. I see a church that is a place full of love and compassion because God told us that that's what His people would be. I see that the Bible tells us that His church is going to be a house of prayer. You know, you, you look at all of those things and you look at the glorious aspects of the church and you say, you know, it, I, I just don't see it in reality. I see it in prophecy, but I don't see it in reality. Well, the, the fact is, there's room for us to grow. 
And that's as much of preparing for the end times as just making sure that we're living right. It's working toward being that people. Growing to the Lord. Growing unto the Lord to become that people. You know, we look at it and we say, well, the church is not... The, the Bible tells us that His house is a house of prayer. But I don't see the church being a house of prayer. Well, start praying more. I don't see the church... Uh, you know, God said that the church was going to be a place of love and His people had to learn to love one another. God did say that, absolutely. Well, I, don't, I don't see that. Then learn to love more. You know, we can't... We, God wants us to work on ourselves. He wants us to grow ourselves. He wants us to work to build ourselves. And as I build myself, Brother Nick builds himself, Brother Rick builds himself, and Brother Chris and Sister Wendy and uh, Ashley and Brother Jason, everybody builds themselves, then collectively we're all getting closer to the Lord. And as we all get closer to the Lord, then this local church is becoming more and more like Christ. And as this local church becomes more and more like Christ, we're start, uh, we will be a church that He can use. And as we become a church that He can use, then the great exploits will begin to happen. And as the great exploits begin to happen, the world will begin to see and will be not silent anymore. And then we're fulfilling the goal that God wants for us. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. I'm not up here to try to tell you that we're there individually nor corporately. I'm not standing up here today telling you that I have arrived. By no means have I arrived. There's a long way for me still to go. Pray for me as I strive to get there. You know, but if we're honest with ourselves, we as you self-reflect and examine and let the Spirit speak to you this morning, you know, it's easy to look out and say, well, the church isn't there yet. Well, look at yourself. Are you there yet? You get there. You get there as I get there. And together, we'll get there together. We'll help one another. We'll build one another up. We'll strengthen one another. We'll encourage one another. And ultimately, maybe it'll be an example to somebody that others will want to do the same thing. And as others want to do the same thing, now we're expanding, we're influencing outside even the four walls of this church. You know, I just want to be pleasing to the Lord. That's our ultimate goal. That's, that's my ultimate goal. I know that that is your ultimate goal as well. You want to be pleasing to the Lord. You want to encourage, uh, you want to be encouraged in the Lord. You want to uh, encourage others. You, you want to see your lost loved ones, friends, family, uh, the world to be saved. I know that's the desire of every one of us. God's not done with us. God doesn't want us to be silent. God doesn't want us to just sit back and, and pat ourselves on the back and say, we're doing okay. Let, let's just, God's not sitting there saying, I'm content with you. I, I, I'm done with you. Just sit there and be finished. No, God's not doing that. What God's wanting from us and what He's trying to speak to us this morning is, my children... Be faithful. Grow. Become more like me. Get ready. Be bold. Take on that holy boldness. Or as we put it earlier, Paul's holy stubbornness. So that we can just influence the world. I, I'm ready to go home. But in order for us to go home, there's still a lot of work we've got to do. Both inside the four walls of the church and outside the four walls of the church. Examine where we are now. Examine where you are now. Because that's the ultimate goal of, of what we're speaking about this morning. We're trying to make a noisy exit. But if we just take what we heard today and just let it be put aside, and it's like, oh, that was a nice nice uh, encouragement from the Lord this morning, or, uh, or, or maybe it was just a good nap time. I, I don't know. But as we're hearing, as we hear the words of the Lord this morning, if we just set it aside and say, oh, I'll reflect on that later, then we're putting aside, then, then we're just kind of wasting our time and we're saying, and we're giving into that spirit of the world where we're saying, you know what? I will just sit here. 
I will just be silent. I will be quiet. I will be at peace. I'll just keep peace, not make, not make peace. I'll just keep peace and not, uh, not um, influence anybody. I'll, I'll, I won't try to change the world. I won't be influential. I'm just sitting here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit back and just be content where I'm at. But I believe that the Spirit within us is wanting us to boldly proclaim this morning, I will not go quietly. The more the enemy attacks us, the more it should strengthen our resolve to lift our voices to heaven and to proclaim the word of the Lord. By His grace, we will overcome. We will conquer our enemy. We will not leave this world quietly, but we will go proclaiming the word of the Lord, proclaiming the truth of God, proclaiming uh, His deliverance and His peace and the need for reconciliation to Him. I want you to think about some other people from the Bible as we're getting ready to wrap this up. Think about Noah. Think about all the heathens that laughed at him and mocked him and noticed that he wasn't leaving quietly. I'm, or I'm sure they noticed, those that mocked him noticed that he wasn't leaving quietly when that door shut and the rain started. God made a noisy exit for Noah. Think about Elijah in 2 Kings 2. He was standing at the Jordan River when all of a sudden a chariot of fire comes out of heaven. It sweeps down and it picks him up. And he throws down his mantle to Elisha. You know, Elijah didn't leave quietly. Think about Samson, and we know the story of Samson, and we know the trouble and adversity that he faced in his life, a lot of it that he brought on himself. But you think about him in his last days, they took him to the temple of Dagon in Judges 16, and his hands were placed on the pillars, and there were thousands of worshipers of Dagon making sport of him and mocking him and mocking the true God. And Samson knew that he was making his exit. And he said, even in my exit and even in my adversity that I brought on myself, I'm not going to leave quietly. He said, I'm not going to allow God to be mocked any longer. And the Bible says he, he slew more in his exit than he did in the rest of his life combined. He made a bigger impact in the world at his exit than he did in the entire remainder of his life combined. You think about Stephen, Jesus uh, or Stephen is just there silently as all of these throw rocks at him. Saul was even standing by holding the coats. But the Bible says his face lit up like an angel and they could not resist the spirit by which he spoke and the seeds of the gospel were planted even in the heart of Saul or Paul at that time. Certainly Paul had to sit there and go, what is, what is up with this man? Here he is, he's just taking this beating, he's taking this death. But he's not doing it silently in the sense that he's not conforming to the world. He, here he is begging that God would not lay this to their charge. What, what, what a man. And I wonder sometimes if that experience didn't influence Paul and his ministry. Think of Enoch. He's walking along one day and he just goes with God. In Genesis 5 and 24. It's thinking that it, people who may have been around with him, here he is just walking along with God and poof, he's gone. He didn't make a quiet exit. He made a dramatic exit. Or God allowed him to make a dramatic exit. And then think about Jesus. Jesus. He rose from the dead. He walked around for 40 days. He was seen by over 500 people. He shows up walking through walls. And then when it's time to go to heaven, two angels come and stood beside him. And he went away in a cloud. And as he rises, the two angels said, Why stand ye here gazing up? The same Jesus that's leaving here today will return in like manner. 
We've mentioned all of these and we're reflecting on all of these great men of the Word of God and how they did not exit this life silently. And we apply that same principle to us individually and corporately as the church. The church is not destined to leave silently. The Bible says that the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump shall be sounded. It's not a quiet exit. Those who are dead in Christ shall rise, and those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet, or caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. Again, this is a noisy exit. Who knows what will go on in this world, the chaos and, and the, the, just the absolute uh, uh, chaos that will ensue. You know, you've seen depiction of this, depictions of this, where what happens to the drivers who are Christians and or what the car is driven by the drivers who are Christians or the planes or or uh, trains or what, whatever other uh, you know can you imagine uh, being in, in Walmart well oh, we're not imagining this I hope we're gone but the people who are around when all of a sudden people just start disappearing from their shopping carts you know there's going to be chaos that's not a silent exit that's a disruptive exit. As the Christians are raptured and God finally puts His stamp of approval and says, my people were faithful and I'm taking them home. Amen. As Christ says, my bride's ready. But the Father says, the bride is ready. Son, go get her. But even before that moment, as we've shared in, this, in the Word, or through the Word this morning, yeah, our final exit is going to be quite noisy, but it's our responsibility to be noisy leading up to it. Let's, again, as we get ready to reflect this morning, as we get ready to have a final word of prayer, I want us to think again. Examine your life. Are you just kind of silently going through your day-to-day -day experience, or you're kind of silently going through and just living out your life day by day, just biding the time until Jesus returns? Or are you making an impact? Are you, making, are you being influential in the world? Are you being influential in your family? Are you being influential in your community? And any other level that you want to look at there and ask yourself about. God has given us the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to be with us so that we can be like Paul and Silas and live our lives with boldness, live our lives with authority, and live our lives uh, through a means that would make that impact that we desire to make. I want to take as many people to heaven as possible. And I know that as children of God, it is your desire to do the exact same thing, to take as many people to heaven as possible. Because as children of God, we don't want to see anyone lost. As I said before, as if our hearts are truly right with God, we don't even want to see our enemies lost. We don't want to see even the vilest person in the world lost because they can have the same experience of grace and salvation that we had and experience of grace and salvation. And Brother Nick, it is my desire more than anything. First and foremost, for me to make it. And second, for you to make it. But then beyond that, let's go save people. Not by our own power, not through our own abilities, but let's go preach the Word of God. Amen. Let's go share with this world the Word of God. You know, we talked about the people who, this morning in Sunday school, we talked about the people who seemingly have everything, yet in their reality they have nothing because they don't have the things that they're truly longing for. And we sit here this morning having the things that they long for. And then we ask ourselves, are we remaining silent on those things? Or are we being as noisy and loud as possible? So as I want us to find a place to go to the Lord in prayer... And I want us to reflect individually on this because this is not a topic that we can point fingers at the person sitting across from us and say, well, you're not doing it, so I'm not going to do it. Or you're not being loud, so I'm not going to be loud. Or 
You're not doing this, so I'm not going to do this. As we reflect this morning, I want you to reflect on what the Spirit of God is telling you. What is the Word of the Lord telling you? What does God want you to do? What does God want you to do to be disruptive? Again, not in a chaotic, disruptive, worldly sense, but disruptive to bring about the plan of God. What does God want you to do to be disruptive to the forces of the enemy? To start reclaiming the things that belong to God. To start making an influence and an impact on the things that God wants to restore and reconcile and do to bring about His will. Let us find a place to go to the Lord and, and, and talk to Him about what we've heard from His Word this morning.